What's going on there, folks? Good evening. It's the Earthmaster here on this Monday, June 13th date. 2022 is the year about 7.20 p.m. California time uh, out here along the West Coast. Latest quake shows a 1.2 earthquake uh, coming into the area of Southern California. Now, it looks like my uh, earthquake 3D globe got turned down a little bit because there's been a lot more earthquakes on the globe than what it was showing over the last 24 hours, including some activity here along the Cascadia subduction zone, the northern end of it, uh, just off the coast of Vancouver Island ranges. I'm going to show you guys here on a different map, uh, the USGS flat scale map. Seeing that 4.6 show up here just off the Queen Charlotte Sound. This plate boundary right here, this red line dropping down here all the way to Northern California is what we call the Cascadia subduction zone. And we've seen a 4.6 earthquake strike on that earlier. Also a little bit of movement further up north uh, along the Pacific and the North American plate boundary, well north of the Cascadia, but a little sign of activity continuing here in this region with a 3.5 in that area. So I'm going to start off real quick first, covering a little bit of activity about the Cascadia subduction zone, a couple articles, uh, and then we'll get into the rest of the update here uh, later on in this video. I'm going to try not to make it a super long one. I'm going to go over this quickly and leave these article links in the description video below because I feel they are pretty important. I don't know if you heard that bird or not, but he was pretty loud. As a bird outside, we have these western scrub jays and they're beautiful birds, smart birds, but man, are they loud. And he went squawking right by the window. All right, so the Cascadia subduction zone, a megathrust fault, uh, it's a thousand kilometer long dipping fault, a subduction fault that stretches from uh, the northern Vancouver Island, which is right up here offshore, uh, down to the Cape Mendocino, California area, and now it's further south. This here is a cross section, and it cross sections right about the middle of the Cascadia. So you got Washington up here. Of course, Oregon and California would be further down on the map if this was a uh, cross section down there. But this is just a little cross section here around Washington, kind of shows you the area of the Cascadia subduction zone and the Juan de Fuca plate offshore that subducts here underneath the North American plate. Now this uh, Juan de Fuca plate, it's literally like three microplates, but we're gonna call it tonight because most people call it just the Juan de Fuca plate. Um, subducting underneath the North American plate way down there, and we're talking deep. Um, it's been shoved down there for quite a while. Um, and we get these major earthquake or this major strain built up here along the locked area. It kind of sits inland here a little bit um, from the red line. And it's been, well, it's been 322 years since we've seen the last major rupture along the Cascadia subduction zone. Now we've had a couple other earthquakes that are related to the Cascadia due to the pressure and the plate dynamics in general here, uh, like some deeper earthquake movements um, way down there, even below, sometimes below the trimmer area. And the trimmer area is roughly about 35, 45 kilometers down dip, downstream here of the locked area. And we get these larger deep quakes sometimes on occasion when things get stuck down there. Uh, and we also get these crustal quakes throughout the area um, of the Cascades and around Seattle and uh, parts of central Washington. They see these little, I shouldn't say little because some of these are pretty large. Um, earthquake above 7.0 crustal faults. Uh, looks like the last one was back in 1872. So sometimes these things do pop up here. They got, uh, I'm not for sure the occurrence, uh, the uh, uh, reoccurrence intervals, but uh, these guys estimating about hundreds of years, maybe. 1872, last crustal earthquake. Now these deep fault earthquakes, last one was back in 2001. I don't re really remember that um, earthquake, but they can occur, it looks like every 30 to 50 years. Now this is down dip around the trimmer area and a little bit further. Uh, looking at 7.0 or greater uh, with the Juan de Fuca plate down there getting stuck into the trimmer area. Uh, you got the locked area that kind of sits right here, right? While the rest of the area slowly subducts underneath the North American plate while you get the you get the building up of pressure backstream here and the rising of the land. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, about the subsidence of what's going to happen when the, uh, when the release is finally... Um, well, released when the pressure is built up. <laughs> when the pressure is built up, I should say. This is a pretty serious 
um, topic, and a lot of people unfortunately don't know about it uh, up there along the Oregon coast. Uh, last time I was up there, I was checking in a motel, and uh, I was asking this uh, lady about uh, if she knows about the uh, Cascadia subduction zone, and she's like, "No, what's that?" And I told her, and then she's just like, "Yeah, I, they got uh, tsunami evacuation zones everywhere." But, you know, it, I don't know. A lot of people are clueless when it comes to the, their knowledge up there along the West Coast. Um, so 30 to 50 year reoccurrence intervals for these deep Juan de Fuca plate subduction quakes. Last one was 2001. Okay, so, eh. Uh, and the subduction zone itself, these guys stating 500 to 16 year reoccurrence interval for an M9.0 or greater. Now, there's some... Uh, there's definitely some variations in that uh, guesstimate, right? It's not 100% accurate. There's been times where these uh, uh, intervals are between uh, 200 to 300 years. And sometimes you get these partial ruptures where an only 8.0 will occur on the southern section of the Cascadia. And um, so this 500 to 600 year interval, I, I don't believe that 100%. We're going to look at the map here in a little bit uh, on the uh, the timeline map. Here's another uh, full section scale of the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, you got the uh, subduction up here all the way off the coast of Vancouver Island. The locked area, the stuck zone, uh, sits here inland a little bit, you know, towards the east. You got this cold front looking system. Well, this would be a warm front on a weather model. Uh, the seaward edge of the subduction zone where the subduction plates meet and begin their descent beneath the North American plate. Now that's uh, that's going to be this warm front looking system. And then you got this tannish color, the stuck or the locked part of the interface between the North American plate and the subducting plates. The fault that breaks in great earthquakes, 9.0 or greater, unless you have just a partial rupture here along the southern segment. Uh, then you can run into the low 8 magnitude range, which would still definitely, I believe, uh, create a subsequent tsunami here for this region. Not as much as a full-scale rupture, uh, but it would definitely be damaging down here in Northern California, Southern Oregon area. Here's the article I'm going to post, and this is a very important read. I did post this up here on Facebook um, a couple days ago for folks to read, uh, not just the folks... Uh, in the Oregon, Washington, Vancouver area, Northern California region, but just anyone in general that is curious about uh, the Cascadia and the subsequent outcome of a great quake uh, along this major subduction zone. This article was put out from the Oregon.gov Office of Emergency Services. Um, this is a document from 2013. Uh, it talks about Cascadia, Oregon's greatest natural threat. And it does go over a lot of stuff, a lot of, uh, well, consequences of a great earthquake. So I just want to show a couple different things here, just some images, but I'm going to let you guys read it. Okay, we're not going to spend an hour or two reading through that. We'll let you guys read it. But uh, here, me and Missy Mimi's went up here, uh, I can't remember if it was earlier this year or late last year, uh, to dig through the uh, area up there and find some old tsunami deposits and we found it uh, we found a pretty good layer of it well inland um, from the beach from the coast range uh, where the tsunami had well went in right right it went in pretty far and um, this is a little cross section here of a clean riverbank viewed at low tide and you can see the tsunami sand right here we've seen these layers and the topsoil as well uh, you got tidal mud as um, on top uh, some fire pits, we didn't find that, but uh, dune sand along the riverbank there as well. A pretty cool little cross section of the amount of tsunami sand uh, that's left behind during a major tsunami event. Uh, let's see here. Let me go back down here. Here's a little timestamp here. Let me zoom this up so maybe you guys can see a little bit there. And it shows you the. Uh, well, the overview, right, on a timeline. And this is, you know, pretty, I think it's pretty accurate. And, you know, because they've gone back and they've dug through this area time and time again, different areas up and down the coast. Uh, they checked offshore. Uh, so they, they get a, the geologists and scientists get a really good idea of 
when these great earthquakes struck and how long ago it was and you know possibly how big it was so we're estimated to be here right to well estimated 2000 the year 2000 i wish i was back in the year 2000 it'd be kind of cool a lot cheaper back then gas prices and whatnot okay we won't go down that road but uh yeah 2022 so you can add 22 years on to that the last major rupture 1700 uh prior to that uh when a couple more hundred years right for the other 9.0 these larger lines right here these deeper lines are the full rupture a magnitude 9.0 or greater fault breaks along the entire subduction zone now these smaller lines are earthquakes of magnitude 8 plus the fault breaks along southern half of the subduction zone lucky us huh here in southern or in the northern california and you can see these little intervals right here looking at uh you know some time period there between them that's probably the 500 year interval right there uh is what i'm guessing close to it but you get these little periods of very active activity and then followed up by a little bit less activity throughout time and and whatnot but things change right things definitely change we look at that the last thousand years or so we've had um well since about 1000 a.d it looks like at least three right am i reading this right three major ruptures 9.0 or greater and only one um partial rupture there and that was before the voyage of columbus so that's pretty crazy uh, to think that, right? So we're looking at, let's see, three, what, 322 years now. There's probably only, in between these two right here, folks, there's probably only 200, 200 250-something years, right? If I'm doing my math right. Hold on a second. So that was uh, 1492, right? I forgot the date of that voyage of Columbus, 1492 to the 1700 time frame. So only 208 years in between these two major ruptures right here. And then prior to that, we had that partial rupture there um, prior to the, villa, uh, the uh, voyages of Christopher Columbus which was in 1492 to 1504. So that's probably only maybe, maybe a hundred years. So the accuracy, you know, they go on average every five to 600 years, you know, they, they might do that. But I think if anything, I think we're definitely overdue for a potential partial rupture of the Cascadia. Uh, but then again, like I said, this is not hundred percent in tune you know this is not a graph to go by for 100 percent accuracy looking at it you know like the stock market or or um you know certain graphs that we look for trends but uh you know it could be any time all i know is it's coming up it's 322 years it's it's been a lot there's a lot of built-up pressure on that thing um so this is just one little map and there's other maps here i want to go over and show you guys the potential of uh damage along the oregon area now this map just kind of covers oregon um and parts of coos bay over here along the extreme coastline uh to the west very heavy damage expected uh, poorly built structures destroyed with their foundations bridges and well built wooden structures heavily damaged and in need of replacement obviously right but look how far the damage uh kind of goes in there into the valley in Roseburg, up through Eugene, Portland, Cavallis, uh, Grants Pass area, Medford in there as well. Uh, definitely some moderate damage, difficult to stand or walk. Uh, furniture broken, damage to poorly built uh, masonry buildings. But then again, you got to remember a 9.0 scenario here um, will definitely travel well inland. Over to the eastern part of Oregon around Bend and whatnot. That's kind of central, I guess. Uh, very light, felt outdoors. Um, I, th I think... That in 9.0 would definitely be felt more than that, though. Uh, further than that. I definitely think so. I, so I don't know how certain that map is. We don't know for sure because we haven't really uh, haven't really experienced it yet, right? Cascadia scenario impact zones. 
Uh, the tsunami, of course, is going to hit along the eastern or the uh, western coast over here. Here's the uh, liquefaction uh, map, right? Quite a bit throughout the valleys around the... That can't be good. Salem, Eugene, up through Portland. Highly populated regions within that area. Uh, this is a ground movement map greater than one foot. Due to uh, uh, liqu liquefaction. Let's see if I can spit that out again. And some others over here in the red due to landslides. So purple due to that. Uh, and the red over here to uh, the landslides. But also over here, looking along the beach, we got that liquefaction option, option, uh, liquefaction scenario as well, unfortunately. Check out this, oh man, this map of this town here. That is not good. I, I think I've been here uh, a while. Isn't this Nesquin? I think that's how you pronounce it. If I didn't, uh, I apologize. Uh, please correct me. But this is a kind of the... Uh, the overview inundation of the uh, tsunami here from a 9.0 Cascadia scenario we got sirens going on we just had a house fire here in town and another fire up in the mountains so man a whole lot of stuff going on today not good um This one right here is pretty important. This one's a little on the scary side. Let me back this out a little bit so you guys can see. So this is again a scenario for a 9.0 earthquake along the Cascadia. And this kind of shows you uh, the subsidence in the land. Now this is the drop, so to speak. Uh, because with the Cascadia subduction zone here, offshore, it's uh, as it goes underneath here, subducts, it's raising this land up and, and kind of tightening it and winding it up like a spring. So when the earthquake does finally unzip along the Cascadia, all this is going to go down, back down into position, so to speak. And this is the uh, subsidence and feet estimate, nine, eight to nine feet in the highest levels, which cover a good portion uh, of Coos Bay, Bandon, Port Ordford, gold beach and brookings oregon area this whole area down here and of course you got areas up north right washington northern california this is just oregon uh but there's a, a massive amount of a land and cities here that's going to go down and this is before the tsunami comes in so you got to picture this in your head i know it's a grim a grim scenario but it's a real scenario that's going to happen one day it's going to happen it's not if if it's going to happen it's not a fairy tale it's definitely a legit um a scenario that will happen here pretty uh pretty soon unfortunately um seven to eight feet and some of the lighter colors and so on uh at least through the valleys uh portions of the valley there in oregon we could see a zero to one foot drop even in that area but as you head westward a little bit of course closer to the coast uh, you get the uh, subsidence there greater. Looks like around Lincoln City, uh, Tillamook area in the four to five foot drop. But even then, though, if you really think about it, uh, even an eight to nine drop foot drop in the land uh, and then a, a tsunami that could be uh, over 100 feet uh, from the Cascadia. That's, you know, that's scary to even think about it. This is why it's very important for everyone to know about the potential um earthquake scenario that could happen here along the Cascadia and the subsequent tsunami so uh, there's a lot of info on here estimated impacts as well worth the read folks let me tell you um, I want everyone to read it so please go check it out there's a lot to it but uh, if you haven't seen it there's a lot of different uh, publications on the Cascadia but this one covers it in great detail and uh, I would definitely uh, recommend everyone checking this out um, I will leave this link uh, from the Oregon.gov website onto this uh, video description below okay so please go check it out guys it's well worth a read and I think we need to uh, definitely be on guard along the west coast stand by for a second here having some weird issues going on with that page 
Is the USGS down? No, they're up. That was weird. Um, okay, so... That's kind of odd. I mean, I heard sirens. Are we still live? It looks like we are. Okay, kind of odd. Not for sure what's going on here with the uh, internet. Yeah, it could be the USGS, though. Kind of a little slow. All right. Um, wow. Where'd the land go? All right. There we go. <laughs> Woo. Goodness. All right, guys. So looking back up here. Yeah, we had those two earthquakes here. Not too often we do we see the earthquakes right smack dab on the Cascadia subduction zone itself. A 4.6 earlier. And what's kind of odd. Let me show you the um, earthquakes Canada map here. These guys have been kind of off and kind of spotty. Sometimes they don't report stuff. Sometimes they do. But they have this earthquake. Check this out here. Look where they have it. They have it, for one, at a magnitude 5.1. And they have this way off the Cascadia. Actually, it's going to be on the Pacific side of the plate boundary uh, with the Juan de Fuca plate. Or in this plate, uh, in this place, it's going to be the Explorer plate, the little micro plate up here. Not on the Cascadia subduction zone. You guys see that? A little difference there? Who's right? Who's wrong? In a world of rights and wrongs, does it really matter? I don't know. Um, but a lot of times I think the USGS is more accurate in their location pinpoint. They're pinpointing location. They may not be uh, accurate in terms of being the first agency to issue the earthquake activity or earthquake data, but they are pretty accurate when it comes to their, uh, uh, their final decision. So the 4.6 uh, off the coast there has been reviewed at 38 kilometers into the subduction zone. Looking at the historical data out here, let me see if I uh, bring in the tectonic plates. Even on here, they're still showing it. Uh, the 4.5 or uh, uh, 4.6, I mean, within this area. So this is historical data. This is kind of interesting here. Uh, it goes back since about 1900, and there has been quite a few earthquakes on the Explorer play itself. Up here on the Cascadia subduction zone, a few, yes. Definitely a few, not super common, uh, but looking at the entire plate as a whole, uh, yeah, the Cascadia, definitely not a whole lot, I would say. That would be specifically on this line. Of course, inland and uh, offshore, there's going to be obvious activity, but uh, yeah, that's uh, hmm, that's pretty crazy. So I believe, firmly believe that's right smack dab there on the Cascadia with that uh, earthquake uh let's see what else we got here um yellowstone national park man you guys see all that weather all the uh rainfall they received up there quite a an enormous unprecedented amount of flooding going on at yellowstone national park so at the same time a little bit of uh, earthquake swarming going on up there around the uh mammoth area wyoming well, this is just the last day, 24 hours of all magnitudes. Only shown 10 earthquakes. Uh, go to seven days, all magnitudes here. And they've added a few more, it looks like. 71 epicenters uh, of earthquakes here in a little linear fashion. So that's kind of odd. A little odd to see that. Normally swarms occur within a, uh, a confined area. But this one's kind of uh, linear right there. And these earthquakes, right down, right down there, between about six to eight kilometers below the surface. These are not surface quakes, but uh, kind of down there a little bit. 71 earthquakes. Let's see what the Yellowstone seismographs tell us here. This is the overview. It looks like over the last, uh, this afternoon time frame, things kind of calming down. See this absence of earthquake activity. But uh, overnight, pretty good handful of quakes there. And if we check out the days prior... Uh, it only amplifies even more. Uh, this was the uh, yesterday's time stamp, time frame. Look at all that, quite a bit. I would definitely say a lot more than 71 earthquakes, and that's just that day. We go back one more day here, day before yesterday, and it continued as well. See, quite a bit. Let's check out the previous day. Yeah, it looks like that's kind of about when it started there. It kind of picked up a little bit. So definitely, I think it's more than 71. You could probably times that number times three, and you'll get a more realistic number. But, uh, you know, sometimes it does take a little bit of time to decipher location, precise location, 
and the uh, precise magnitudes and whatnot when it comes to swarms like that. So I'm sure they'll get to it. All right, uh, so moving on past the... Uh, got a mosquito in here, it looks like. Um, past the Yellowstone area, a little bit of activity outside of Redding, California today. A uh, couple small microquakes north of the Battle Creek Fault, a 2.6 and a 1.5. Uh, one earthquake out here this morning uh, into the area south of Eureka. Uh, not a big one, a little 1.9 it looks like. Pacific Northwest all showing not a whole lot of activity. We'll check out some seismographs here in a little bit in that area. A little spotty movement up and down the state of California throughout the Ridgecrest area. Still awfully quiet here along the eastern section of the Sierra Nevada and uh, Southern California. Not ramping up too much. Got a little bit of swarming going on here around the uh, San Jacinto Fault Zone, the Anza section. Buck Ridge Fault area. Seeing that little swarm of movement and uh, a little activity further down south. Nothing spectacular going on around the Salton Sea area. Uh, no major swarms to report there around the Brawley Seismic Zone. Low activity into the Baja, Mexi or the Baja California region. Uh, activity in Texas kind of amping up here. Look at this within the last hour. A couple of earthquakes here, or at least one around the uh, Pecos, Texas area. These are all magnitudes. Wow, okay. And one up here on the Oklahoma Texas border near uh, Leon. Leon? Leon? Uh, 2.3. This one pretty shallow. Let's see where we're at here. Let's see what we got. Check out the satellite view and see if, uh, see if anything's out there, folks. What do you guys see? Are these farmhouses? Some of them maybe. Uh, this one over here might be, but when you got barren land, and these little squares that go into gravel roads, those are those kind of look like older ones, older pumping operations, and uh, earthquake activity within feet of those, a 2.3 at 2.5 kilometers. Uh, let's go ahead and back out of this region, uh, the rest of Oklahoma. Still seeing some movement up here in the Wakita Trend and gas oil fields here. That's going to be this area right here, um, outside of Medford area. Two, 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 right there. A couple twos and some threes there over the last 24 hours or so. New Madrid zone, pretty quiet. Eastern part of the country as well, folks. Puerto Rico, a little spotty activity, and uh, South America region about the same. One area that we have seen a little activity kick up on is out here around the Georgetown region, uh, Ascension Island. Check out the last seven days of activity here. We've got quite a bit of swarming going on here in this area uh, of the Ascension Island area. And it's it's a, uh, there's a little bit of info on this, uh, on this region, folks. It is a, uh, a Mid-Atlantic Ridge plate boundary. Um, this thing is volcanic just to the west here. Right? It's been about 500 years, though, since they've had any type of uh, volcanic activity. Uh, Ascension last erupted about 500 years ago. But it is around the hot spot area of volcanic activity down there in the... Uh, I get a lot of rising of magma from from deep in the mantle so uh yeah we'll have to watch that pretty closely folks it is confined to this little area um this plate boundary system that kind of separates down here it's a spreading of the sea floor which is a uh divergent boundary Got a lot of fractures out there, so got to watch out pretty closely. Sometimes you can get these volcanoes popping up here. But uh, looks like so far we've been confined to a bunch of fives and fours. I know historical earthquake activity is quite high in this region, so it's not like we haven't seen this before. Uh, but it's been a while, right? It's definitely been a while. Up here to the northeast along the plate bound, well, actually within this whole region here, uh, we get quite a few fives to sixes uh, in this area, so not super rare. Just uh, definitely been amping up here within the last couple days or so. 
specifically around this region. So we'll watch it pretty closely. Anything can happen, right? I mean, we can we can uh, say, well, this happened five years, five hundred years ago, and it's got another five hundred years to go before the uh, before a volcano comes up out of the Atlantic, and uh, you know, who knows what? But uh, <laughs> that would be a bad scenario. Anything is possible, I think. You know, if it if uh, you look back on history. Hopefully that won't be the case. That would not be good. Um, let's see. Let's back out of here. Further down south, South Atlantic Ocean did see a 4.9 in the southern mid-Atlantic Ridge. Also down here, southwest Indian Ridge seen a 4.8 near the Prince Edward Islands. This one. Um, yeah, this one, this area down here gets some activity as well. Uh, let's see what do we got going on off the coast of Japan, south of Japan there, or south of Tokyo, I should say, south of Japan Trench. Looks like a 4.5 coming in here within the last hour, about 10 kilometers for that earthquake. Uh, a little spotty activity down south, and uh, of course up around the bend again, around China and eastern part of Afghanistan, all seeing some height movement. But I think for right now, I think the obvious activity is uh, moving up and down the board here of the Pacific Plate, North American Plate boundary. Uh, definitely seeing some activity ramping up there uh, today. So uh, we'll definitely watch that pretty closely. Uh, looking at Hawaii, a little bit of spotty activity. Aside from that, 12 earthquakes. That's not that big of a deal. Let me tell you, that's not that big. Uh, let's see, tremor activity, eight, eight. Woohoo! it's a party. Eight epicenters of tremor down here at the southern end of the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, volcanic activity, or at least earthquake activity here around Mount St. Helens, we'll double check that. Nothing showing up here on the map uh, far as the PNSN network reporting goes. Let's go ahead and check out the recorded data and make that decision ourselves, right? Yeah, a little, little, little bit of activity here in the blue, the red over the last couple hours. But, uh, over well, there's a pretty good size one earlier this afternoon. That's probably got to be at least a low grade one. But nothing showing up on the PNSN network board or the USGS. So I still find that rather odd. Obviously, there's earthquake activity. How big does it have to be to show up? That's the question. All right, guys, uh, what else we got? Solar weather activity. Let me double check this here real quick. I know this is getting pretty interesting on a lot of people asking about this. It looks like the uh, adjustment here, like I mentioned here over the last couple nights, uh, June 15th timestamp, UTC date. Uh, looking at a KP index of uh, up around the five to six with a G1 class storm coming in. 65% chance of uh, roars at higher latitudes and 30% chance at the mid latitudes. And I'm sure this is coming from, you guessed it, the coronal hole that's been facing us here over the past couple days, uh, enhancing the wind stream. There was a pretty powerful CME and a long duration M flare uh, late last night that blew from 3030, but that was mostly pointed that way, uh, further to the east, and not directly um, aimed at us. The specific sunspot itself and its friends are coming along for a big ride. Uh, and they're looking pretty, uh, they're looking pretty active, and potentially sparking up some more sparkies here on the sun, and some more solar flares. A couple other further developments here, and one right smack dab in the middle disk of the sun. Uh, not too often do we see that directly in the middle. So if that thing pops here, we'll uh, be dead center of the Earth. Um, so yeah, there's that long duration M flare that kicked off. That's a pretty good one, an M3.4. Uh, right now, yeah, these guys up their solar flare potential, which looks a lot more accurate in my book. A C flare, 85% chance, M flare at 35% chance, and an X flare at about 10% chance. So things getting cooking, popping, so to speak, on the sun once again after oh, about, what, about a week of nothing. A week and a half of nothing, so I'm, I'm glad to see it kicking back up here. There's that uh, long duration M flare. I kicked off last night. It did create a major CME, but again, away from us. That was a massive CME as well. Uh, yeah. All right, so we'll just we'll continue to watch it and see how it goes. Over the past uh, 
Let's see here. We did have a little spike here, a little sparky up around the upper C-class flare. C8.5 in the um, solar X-ray chart here. Looks like we're starting to amplify up again. Maybe getting ready to spark off another one. We'll see how that uh, see how that goes overnight. All right, guys, stay safe out there. And again, if you get a chance, please read the link that I'm going to be posting in this video. It's well worth the read. And uh, I think everyone should just, you know, obviously be uh, observant to it. You know, you can't you can't just say, oh, well, if it happens, it happens, whatever. You know, it's a, that's not a good, <laughs> that's definitely not a good uh, uh, mindset. I wouldn't want to be in that position. If I'm over there, well, I'm here in Northern California. I'm going to feel it regardless. But if I was along the coast, I would definitely want to prepare myself, my family, my friends, business owners. Hey, this is what's going to happen one day. Um, we only got this amount of time to get out of here if we can. And, um, you know, just always just be prepared. You know, it's always good to be on guard when you live along the West Coast. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I hope folks take heed and um, brush up on their earthquake safety their earthquake plans uh, along the cascadia because one day that's uh it's going to be a uh, it's going to be all over the news folks world news uh when that thing decides to go so all right guys have a good night stay safe out there we will chat you a little bit later world's getting crazy crazy and crazier can we get can we get any crazier i don't know you tell me have a good night folks stay safe